Hi, I'm Mike Marino, and this is a brand new episode of Live from My Mother's Basement. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Live from My Mother's Basement. You know, a lot of people ask me all the time, is that the basement? No, this isn't the basement. This is the studio extension in North Hollywood, California. We wish we were in the basement, but we're on the California side of the world today. So maybe you'll catch another show that is going to be at the bar. But tonight, we're doing something different. Having a guest on the show that I'm not familiar with his work other than his resume. I'm not familiar with his life other than his resume, my producer Tatiana and I decided let's do something different. Let's bring in a guest that works in showbiz, but in a totally different lane than the one that I'm in or a lot of people that I know. Most people say it's behind the scenes shit, which not a lot of people get to see unless there's some kind of a documentary or the behind the scenes of it. But I'm gonna throw that into the wind right now as a behind the scenes and we're going to see where this interview is going to go because this is going to be very interesting i want everybody to hear exactly how this actually happens because like i said it's not something that's always you don't see this on a talk show much mm. it's not like you're going to see the tonight show go hey, you know what we got a cinema photographer let's talk to him about about the behind the scenes which in a way is probably a shame because some of these guys, or most of these guys, could be responsible for the success of the actor anyway. So here we got Sean O'Grady. Thank you so much for coming over, oh, Sean. Appreciate I you. appreciate that, yeah, man. Bro. Holy shit. Let's start off with where are you from? Well, first of all, this I think we should call this episode How the Sausage is Made. Okay. You know what I mean? Because like, it's behind the scenes. He did right? his research. Yeah. He <laughs> says sausage yeah, so in my house. You know well, I mean? okay, then. He researched everything. <laughs> O'Grady yeah, researched know. the Italian guy. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, Shawnee, Shawnee Cameras, Sean O'Grady, from the Washington, D.C. area, born and raised. And, so, wait a minute. Wait, tell yeah, me, he got a know. nickname. Yeah, boy. An East Coast guy with a nickname. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> However, <laughs> his is really different. Yeah. Shawnee Cameras. Well, it works so well because, you know, my mom used to call me Shawnee growing up, you know what I mean? And then, um, you know, years later, I was on one of my first tours with a band, and we were in Toronto, and Gary Gavon from, you know, North Jersey, straight up, that was his name, and he comes on the bus, and I'm, like, editing, you know, uh, some videos from the night before, and he's like, oh, fucking Shawnee cameras, just never leaves the bus, what are you doing? You're going to come out and get some poutine? And I was like, I guess that's the fucking nickname, and I was Poutine? Like, Oh, we were in Toronto. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. say so Canadian guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, he's, he's from Jersey. He was from Jersey. So, anyway, yeah. So, that's yeah. a nickname. I, I love these nicknames already. First of all, yeah. we're hearing Sausage oh, yeah. from an Irish guy. We're hearing, what did you say his name was? Goomba? Oh, Gavon. 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 Which Gavon. I don't know if a lot of people mean it's kind of like, you know, it's a bit of an asshole. <laughs> and, you know, a hump. Uh, you know, a you know, pain in the ass. Yeah. You're a Gavon. Yeah. That's slang. Very slang. I love it. And then... Uh, Shawnee cameras, I guess cameras has something to do with the fact that you shoot. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'm a photographer, filmmaker, videographer, director of photography. I mean, really anything that you can shoot. I like to kind of just take all those things and be like visual media artist. You know, that's kind of the easiest way to say it. And poutine is French fries with gravy and cheese. That's what they call it in Canada. Yeah, buddy. And I know that because I get to go to Canada a lot to entertain but in New Jersey, that would be called disco fries. That's right. And you get it at a diner. That's right. At three o'clock in the morning when you're trying to come down off your high. A good Greek diner. <laughs> a good Greek <laughs> diner. See, he said Greek. It's true, bro. He told the truth. It's true, bro. I love when people tell the truth. You go, we went to a really good diner. It was Italian. Bullshit. You want to hear something even funnier? So in D.C., so like there's carryouts that are open till four in the morning, and those are like Chinese spots, and they, they do like mumbo wings and mumbo wings are like a very 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 indigenous thing to washington dc where like it's like hot sauce ketchup barbecue sauce mustard whatever and it's all made into a sauce and each different uh neighborhood or carryout will have their own ratio of what is what sometimes it's a little sweet sometimes a little smoky sometimes a little spicy yada 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 i'm and, getting hungry and people are fiercely 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 allegiant to their carryout and their set of the neighborhood 
And in the same vein, there's also pizza places that are open till like two, three, four in the morning. Those pizza places are not owned by Italians. They're owned by Greeks. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny as hell. There's baklava and like mana, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> You know what? I love Greek food. Yeah. The people tell me all the time, hey, you want to go for a Italian food? I'm like, no, I'd rather have something that I don't normally have. There you go. Greek food is great, even if you don't say it right. They said gyro, 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 whatever yeah. the hell it is. It's delicious. I forget, remind me, where were you born? What city? Yeah, I was born in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside Washington, D.C., and cut my teeth as a professional in Baltimore and Washington, D.C. A professional? A photographer, videographer, filmmaker. Is it really all in one? Because a photographer, we think, okay, you go get your headshots, or they shoot a wedding. That's a a fantastic question, and I'd love to show you how the sausage is made, you know what I mean? Uh, Photographers... We were talking about staying in your own lane right before we, we went on. A lot of photographers, if they're blessed enough, like can stay in their own lane and really do like, you know, just be the wedding photographer or just be, you know, the headshot photographer or a portrait photographer, right? But I think with these days, not only with the advent of technology, but also with rates dwindling and the saturation level of people that want to get into creative arts, right? Whether it be acting or DJing or visual, you know, media, you kind of have to wear many different hats to maybe create one income. So I'm what is known as affectionately as like a hybrid because I think I effectively do photography very well. I get paid for it decently. And I also shoot, you know, live video or I'm sorry, like, you know, like live photos, essentially, you know, video, film, etc. And I have to do all these different things, plus edit, plus produce, plus direct to create one income. So you have to kind of wear all these hats unless for some reason you're able to kind of stay in that one lane and create your career that way. It's one of the reasons why I got into stand-up because I wasn't really making enough money as an actor and the chances of you getting acting work were a little slimmer than getting work as a comedian. Perfect correlation. Comedians could actually go get their own work, create your own rhythm, whereas an actor you might have to wait for an audition and then hope you even get it. And comedians are natural writers. You're writing your own jokes. Well, you know? that's true. I'm constantly writing. My my head explodes every day with stupid shit that I want to talk to. I mean, if I if I could just watch the election one more hour, I could come up with ten hours of stand up material. It's ridiculous. And that's how I, you know, I'm so blessed to do what I do. But I know when I've been on uh, um, some movie sets and stuff, and you watch the cinematographer or the guy behind the camera. Um, in fact, Tatiana's husband, Cody, directs the series that we were doing, Make America Italian Again, and we were doing these improvs, and everything was kind of like more of a sketch and an idea, not stuck to the script. Yeah. So I think sometimes we were driving him crazy because I'm like, um, well, you say this, and I'll say this, and this is the idea. So he shot it, but he shot it so well that he did the editing. Yeah. And I, I said in so many film festivals that we actually won some film festivals, the editor made it funnier than it was when we were shooting it. Uh, it yeah, I can't believe it. I'm like, man, it's 10 times funnier. Look what he did. Yeah, you can, I mean, there's timing that happens organically on set that happens like, you know, within the moment or within the shot. But like people really discredit <clears throat> editing that don't edit themselves or don't get recognized like that, you know, in like award ceremonies and stuff, how crucial editing is. Yet no clients ever want to fucking pay for it. They think it's included in the package. Yeah, it's not. It's a separate art with a separate software and a separate skill set that you need to create the fucking sausage. I'm gonna keep bringing up the sausage because it's. Just, I love sausage. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Otherwise, you've got a bunch of fucking ground meat that like looks good, but if it's not encased in something, then it's just a, a bunch me- of ideas. A mess. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so you do the editing too. I try not to because no one wants to pay for it anymore. Oh, wow. So I do edit. I, I like to think of myself as a very good editor. I can find, maybe I'm not a comedic editor. That's another thing that if you really want to break shit down, it's like there's editors that can edit music videos, but I wouldn't want them to like edit a wedding. And I wouldn't want a wedding editor to edit a comedy bit. Editing comedy or narrative, like effectively to get the beats, to get the tone, to get like, the actual mood of like a scene, like a real scene together, that is a whole other ballpark than shooting and cutting like a 90 second social sizzle for Instagram. That's yeah. a whole other, whole other game. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I do remember, and I, I could contest to this day, 
when I watch what he did in the editing room to the scenes, I'm like, damn, he made it 10 times funnier. I didn't even yeah. know it was going to go like that. And that's cool. Thank <laughs> you for you get recognizing that? that too, though. You know what I mean? Like how crucial, like it really does come together in post-production. Maryland, as far as I know, is not really known for professionals in the industry coming out uh -huh. and, and making projects. Uh -huh. uh, we think New York, California. 100%. No, we have actually have a really strong alumni. Like one, so one of my favorite filmmakers, photographers, actors of all time is Spike Jones. Spike Jones is music video director, skateboard video director, actor. I mean, he's done. I mean, Lost in Translation. No, that, that's Sofia Coppola. I'm sorry. Uh, he's done a lot of films. Bottom line, and he grew up like right down the street from where I grew up, which is amazing. Edward uh, Norton is from Columbia, Maryland, and. Um, you know, never mind like The Wire and all the, you know, alums that came through The Wire that not all of them were local, but, you know, still um, Homicide Life on the Streets. And then, um, you know, they did uh, what's it called? Um, the political drama. Kevin Spacey was on. It's on Netflix. Edit. We'll be right back. After yeah. This commercial fucking... break. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's some strong alum. There's, um, oh, God. What's his name? Um, um, uh, he's the Punisher. He's from Washington, D.C. Well, how long were you in uh, uh, Maryland before you came out to Los Angeles? Oh, I lived there for uh, most of my life, uh, 35. Uh, I, was, I, I lived there up until 2017. And then just 100% needed a change of pace. You know, like it's easy. I'm sure you can identify this with Jersey or, or New York or really anywhere. But like, you know, the, speaking of like staying in your lane, you know, D.C. is it, it, there, there are some creative aspects to it. Maryland, there's some creative aspects to it. But like if you're... If you want to work in features or anything like that, the, the best you can get is like second unit. You know what I mean? You can get second unit, but like they're flying in creatives, not from, you know, Maryland or D.C. They're flying in the creatives from New York. They're flying in the creatives from L.A. or Miami or Atlanta. You know, they're not hiring a local DP to shoot your feature. They're going to fly those people in. So if you stay in D.C., you can make a great living working for, you know, doing corporate video or for the government or weddings or commercial with a lot of commercial work and advertising and stuff like that. But... There's nothing that, like, for me, was keeping me there that was testing my metal. So eventually, I needed to go to a place where I wanted to do more than what the city was offering. And Los Angeles, to me, is just, you know, it, it's a necessary evil because it puts me in the proximity to opportunity that I want to be a part of. So how long have you been in Los Angeles? Uh, almost seven years. Seven years in August. Los Angeles is a tough place. Yeah, they say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. No, 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 no. <laughs> You come to Los Angeles and see how badly you get your ass kicked. Then go to New York and you'll be like, I got this. Because <laughs> this is the plethora. Everybody comes yeah. from around the world to land in Los Angeles to see what they can do in the magical world of show business, which is uh, tough. There's, there's a lot of people out here. But you know what? The so-called saying, the cream rises. And it does. And eventually you just start making some friends and you start getting on projects and rolling with the punches and your friends, as far as I'm concerned, end up being the, the caveat, the agent, the person who says, oh, by the way, we're working on this, and then you end up getting something because they're going, or vice versa. That's why I'm so happy I'm doing my podcast and, and bringing different people to the table or the basement so that we can keep on going and, and, and rock the flow. So if your ultimate goal was achieved, what would that actually be? Because cinematographer on a set, being in the, the, I don't know, was the cameraman's union, director's union? I don't know all of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, no, I'm well, honestly, neither do I. You know, IATSE, uh, I think it's the local 600, which is the office, I think it's right down the street. Oh, is that right? Yeah, they're they're like, I think DPs, photographers, and cam ops. You're gonna, someone's gonna fact check the shit out of me, and like, I'm gonna be like, all right, I, you know, I don't know what I don't know, right? You know, but there's like the DGA approach, the Directors Guild of America, and PGA, Producers Guild of America. You know, all that sounds well and good, but, you know, I've just been so, I've been non-union my entire life. Like, I don't really know any different. So until, like, those opportunities and that education is presented to me, like, I'm just going to kind of stay in my lane. It almost seems like now non-union would be almost the way to go because you could shoot with a phone. Free There's so agent. many different ways to do uh, yeah. showbiz now. You're not shooting on film anymore. Uh, if, if anybody even shoots on film anymore, I mean, I, I really don't know that type of a thing. Yeah, I usually like to stay in my lane. Like when I'm a performer, I'm like, like I don't even want to know what you guys are doing. Let me just focus. 
Yeah, they, they do. I mean, it's it's expensive and it happens, you know, from time to time. There's a lot of, there's a few features, I think, that are up for Oscars right now that's shot on film because, you know, a, a, a DP and a director will have the synchronicity and the money and the blessing of the studio to, you know, take that chance to want, you know, to have that because there is just something very different. There is a tonality, a visual tonality with film that just, it, it's warmer, it's grainier, it's textured, it's, there's something about it that's just absolutely different. Well, here's a, somewhat of a stupid question. No, oh, yeah, I love it. Because if somebody asked me this question, I would say, well, I can't really answer that because I like doing everything. Mm -hmm. So if somebody said to me, what would you prefer to do, stand-up comedy or acting, I'd say both of them. That's the answer, both of them. So if I was to ask you, what is your preference? Do you want to be a director and somebody else is holding the camera? That's a great do question. Do you want to be the guy holding the camera and say, this director is a moron? No, <laughs> that's mean, a great question. What, is, what, what would be your thing? I was, it's so funny, I was on a, a call with a client yesterday and he asked me if I wanted to, um, there's some new opportunities coming in with this company to do some production work. And prior to this, I was doing you know some DP work for them recently uh, in Salt Lake City. And to answer your question, which is what I said to him, is I don't know what I want to do on any given day. Some days I want to be the photographer and some days I don't. Some days I want to be the producer and some days I want to be the director. Some days I want to be the director of photography, and some days I don't want to deal with any of that shit, and I just want to be behind the scenes. So I kind of like this, you know, kind of pick and choose Tetris lifestyle where I don't know what piece is going to fit in that typical day. And sometimes, you know, we eat shit, and that's just what it is. But like, I like kind of having the skill set and um, the variety to kind of like leapfrog and hopscotch between different positions depending on the project and how I feel during that day. And sometimes you have to do all of those positions. All at once. Yeah. You know what I mean? I remember being on some really cool movies and some commercials, and you see the director go, I want this, and I want that, and i got to look like this, and I'll be right back. And then the cinematographer goes, okay, everybody. And he puts the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. And it just made me wonder, did he know what he was going to say, and he was going to do it anyway? Well, I think it's there. That's why like a lot of directors work with DPs the same um, you know, from project to project because they have that unspoken language, almost like, you know, Kobe and Shaq or like two basketball players that yeah. just throw up alley-oops to each other without, you know, the no-look passes and all that. That's like a DP and a director. And if you want to throw in another person in the mix, you'd have like your gaffer, like your lead lighting tech that would help actually shape the light with your director of photography to help achieve the look, mood, and feel that you want per scene. That's the terminology for the, terminology for the lighting guy? A yeah, gaffer? Yeah, it's, it's British. It's gaffer. Yeah, yeah gaffer. where did that come from? Yeah, it's British. Oh, you know the history of it? Yeah, it's, it's British. You know, Another so. nickname. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They call me the gaffer. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm a gavone, but I'm a gaffer. That might be something different in Jersey, you know what I mean? <laughs> like the gaffer comes and you know, takes you out to pasture. <laughs> I'm a gaffer. How many people have you gaffed? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, you got to be careful with that. No, it's gaffer, yeah, lighting director. Um, <coughs> preference to shoot? As far Music as? Music video. Oh, wow. Full-length full, full length feature, skateboarder, oh, wow. surfer, outdoor, indoor. Yeah. You say it all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, once again, you know, uh, variety is a spice of life, and life is a buffet, and I want to come back and eat it twice, so it's like... What a great line. You know, Rewind I, this show. Yeah. Did you hear what he just said? Life is like a buffet, I want to eat it twice. You know what I mean? Just go back, you know. That get could be a really potatoes. dirty joke, too. Oh, yeah, you can <laughs> She's have like it. a buffet, this girl. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It's a little early in the morning for this show. That's good, man. No, you can use it, it's Friday, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, once again, like... Back to our initial conversation about like, you know, are you just a photographer? Or are you just a wedding photographer? Or are you just, you know, someone that does features? Like, I kind of like the fact that I can kind of like wear so many different hats, which allows me more work opportunities. And there's a lot of people out here, like, especially like, you know, like last year who weren't working a lot because unfortunately maybe they were handcuffed by the strikes, you know, or because they're union. Or if they're not union, maybe they're only used to working on professional sets. So they don't know how to like downsize mentally to work on like a corporate video or to work on a music video or to work on some like a social advertising video or something like that. You know what I mean? So I, I like the fact that I can like, you know, gear up for like a social campaign, which I'm doing next Monday and then gear up for a corporate conference, which I'm doing two weeks after that and then gear up for a photography conference that I'm doing in San Diego. Like I can kind of, you know, just go around. You give the seminar? No, I'm not. I'm I'm photographer. I'm being uh, the photographer for those. But, right. Yeah, but I've done public speaking before. If you couldn't tell. 
<laughs> well, yeah, yeah. No, I can see that. Yeah. You can teach. You know, I'm reading in your um, your thing over here, and which well, I know one of the things that caught uh, Tatiana's eye, my producer, Tatiana. You wrote about being sober, and yeah, you know when to talk, you know when to shut up. You know, <laughs> we were laughing. I'm like, hey, we got to get this guy over the house. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Now you're in California now, seven years, which is a crazy town. It could take you down streets that you didn't think you were ever going to go. Sometimes the bad way, sometimes the good way, sometimes make you go all the way back home and say, I got to get out of here. I got eaten. Um, but do you want to touch a little bit about that? Because Yeah. Yeah, sure. I think it's, I think it's important. You know, it's not I mean, something... an Irish guy who drinks? Yeah, who no. fucking saw that coming, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. If this is Vegas, I would have put all my odds on that, you know? No, it's it's something that's a part of me, but it's not something that defines me. And it's and I talk about it on podcasts just to kind of like, you know, give it light to you know let people know that it's okay and you know you you can be successful and live a life that you wanted to without all the things that you know used to compromise it. So you know, well, I I want to. I don't even know how to touch on this, but you lost a hundred and forty pounds. Yeah, all all. I mean, that's another that. person. Yeah, a hundred and forty pounds is another person. Yeah, I'll, sh I'll show you a, I can't a photo even believe later. Yeah, it's crazy. That you would yeah. be 150 pounds heavier. Yeah. Really? Yeah, buddy. And you know how I, I helped uh, get that off was uh, walking to Hunger Park. Oh, really? Yeah, right around the corner. Where I go. Yeah. Do you go there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I used to walk that park, man, for like two hours. I do the morning walk. I do it on That's Instagram. Great. I did it because during the pandemic, I didn't know what to do with myself. I'm walking Perfect. around outside by the park at the Hunger Park with a mask on. I probably saw you, bro. Yeah, and then I just put up my camera and said, hi, everybody, what are you doing? I probably saw you. Then I started inspiring people to go for a walk. Do you remember the dude that used to set up that outdoor gym? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on the north side of the park? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I used to, I'm like, that guy's got it dialed. That is a hustle. There's a lot of people out at that park training, yep. and you know what? There's some guys out there that are shredded. Yeah, fucking dude. ripped. Yeah, dude. And they go to that the 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 by the the one seventy or whatever it is. I can't remember what the turn yes. off, the turn off is. It's the one seventy. And, and they hit the jungle gyms with all those like outdoor. Dude, I've seen some guys out there. I'm like, yo, what are, what are you on, bro? They look like they're training yeah. with the word that was used a long time ago called calisthenics. These guys are working out on a jungle gym that probably should have been torn down in the 1950s. It's all chipped and whatnot. Mm -hmm. They're hitting a the heavy bag out there, but there's the most eclectic amount of people from God knows where. And then you got all the homeless tents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and didn't they move everybody north to like they made that that like encampment or whatever? Like as I was leaving a few years ago. It's very sad, especially when the rains hit like this and all these yeah. homeless people are out there with no choice and 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 nowhere to go. Yeah. So um, tell us about this history of that. Uh, situation that you were in how did yeah. you lose 140 pounds yeah man well quitting drinking helps <laughs> spoiler alert you know that that'll you know help you a lot and then um you know so when i came out to la you know you said something about like this town can eat you 100 percent. and i had been coming here and visiting <clears throat> and running amok here for you know way prior to that you know a lot of you know like war stories i'm not going to get into and i knew that if i wanted to come here and try this thing you know 100 percent. i needed to be 100 percent. So I came out here, I got clean and stayed clean and I had a plan. And my plan was to get out here, to get clean, to stay clean and lose the weight. Because if I didn't feel like I was gonna be respected like physically, then I wasn't gonna be respected internally or vice versa, right? So I, that was my plan, get clean, lose the weight because I didn't think people took me seriously but I was like a fat dude. I kind of felt like the brunt of the joke. I felt like the Chris Farley. Isn't you know it amazing, I mean? though? You meet somebody new who's never seen a picture of him 140 pounds heavier. I can't even fathom what that would look like. Yeah. It's another person. It's heavy. It's very heavy. Yeah. Right now, I look at you like, oh, I wonder where he's training. I want to go. <laughs> he's slim. He's trim. Nice looking fella. Yeah, I'm all right. I mean, I could stand to lose 20 pounds. I never had a drinking problem in my entire life. You know what the problem I have with drinking? It gives me heartburn, and I can't really have it. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably it. the only Italian kid who really can't have a glass of red wine mm. without going to get a Tums. Mm. <laughs> and it doesn't taste good putting the two together. So I'm not a wine drinker, really not a beer drinker. 
I get high. I can take there the dummy. Go. And that's, I, that's that's my... Oh, here comes the fucking leaf oh, blower. Perfect. Yeah, sound. It's always when you're running the sound. The leaf blower. Yeah, always when you're running sound. Hey, can you stop? We're recording in here. Isn't that hilarious? There's no leaves. There's really nothing to blow. He just comes here every, what, Thursday or Friday, and he blows the dirt. It's just... But there's no dirt. No. I, used to, I videotape this guy all the time. <laughs> I'm like, there's nothing here. You're yeah. putting dirt on the cars. <laughs> this is where you can pay me to edit to put in the closed caption for, for what we say. You know what I mean? This is, this is how you, you, you just got a job yeah, coming over to a podcast. Boom. That's can how you, we do can it. you cut this? <laughs> can you fake it? What can you do? Can you get rid of the sound effects? The leap floor. Yeah, Topaz what? AI should actually take out that background noise. We should actually tell him to come in. Come on in. Yeah. Ruin this shoot. Yeah, that'd be great. You already did. <laughs> but we were talking about this uh, this thing, you know. A friend of mine <clears throat> who's clean and sober 30 years, God bless him. he makes so many industry contacts at the meetings that they have yeah. every other night or whatever. And I'm like, you met who? Mm -hmm. What star? Yeah. <laughs> all, he goes, yeah, he's there all the time. He led this meeting. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Then he goes, well, why don't you come? And I'm like, could I go? What do I say? Well, if it's an open meeting, you can come. If it's a closed meeting, then no. Wow. There's a, there's a difference. It's not like you're not welcome, but an open meeting is for friends, family, supporters, curious people, and closed is uh, for people that are afflicted or identify as afflicted as an addict or alcoholic. But what could it be about drinking that you would be 140 pounds heavier? Because to me, it doesn't seem like that would cause a weight problem. You would think somebody who smokes a lot of weed would have a weight problem because you're constantly eating. Well, Mike, I did that too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just drinking. <laughs> There's other things, you know? It oh. opens doors. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I did a lot of other things. But what made you say, okay, you know what? I'm going to drop weight. I'm going to lose weight. You couldn't have said to yourself, it's got to be 140 pounds. 40 pounds is a miracle. Yeah, no, 100%, man. I mean, so when I, I'd always kind of like been around like around the 280 mark, you know, uh, through my, you know, early adulthood. How you tall know, are you? 5'11". You're only 5'11", and you were at yeah. that? Wow. Yeah, yeah, big boy. A left tackle, you know. <laughs> Football, huh? Uh, for like a year or two. I don't know. Right. But yeah, big boy, you know, lineman. And um, so I'd always been a big guy. And like the most I could ever kind of shave off was around 30, 40 pounds. And, uh, and then would come right back. So basically, when I came out here to get sober, I just, I wasn't eating a lot. You know, when I was drinking like a lot, you know, I would just drink, you know. And I, when I stopped drinking, I kind of like, you know, wanted to eat my feelings because I was in a whole other you know, mindset. So I put on 50 pounds in like two, two or three months, like pretty quick, you know, just eating and just being, you know, stagnant, not doing shit. And it was uh, October 2017. And I went to the doctor and she's like, dude, you got to do something. And I, there's a f photo because, on my because phone. Because of the weight or the alcohol? Well, I was like three or four months clean at that point. So she was like, your weight. And so there's a, there's a photo on my phone. I'll show you that was taken that day. And it was that day I decided to do something about it. And I started on a bike. I'm going to get your phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want it. It's right over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I started on a bike, and then the bike got stolen, and, uh, you know, in typical Orange County fashion, and I uh, I started walking. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you this. This is, this is a good time. It's a, it's, as the kids would say, it's a flex. 140 pounds. Oh, my God. Oh, are you ready for this I one? I got to hear the whole story. No fucking way. <laughs> yeah, fucking That's way. you? Yeah, buddy. 3.30. How long ago was this? Uh, October 2017. All right. Yeah, throw it up there. Get a look. Super happy. Really fucking happy. Look at that. How, many, how, how heavy was this? Oh, 3.30. Can't do it. It's a double XL shirt. I can't even fit. Look at that, three hundred and thirty pounds. Yeah, you look like another person. <laughs> it was. Look at your face. <laughs> yeah, no shit. How different that is. That's crazy. Wow, that really is incredible. This almost looks like a movie, like a, a a poster for some movie that's yet to come out. It's a sad movie. Wow. Or inspirational, one of the two. Wow, it's just really like a whole nother person. Yeah, man. So you would assume, well, I would assume, looking at a picture like this, guys, that the only way to lose weight from something that looks like this, I'm sorry, you'll be 
would be lipo. Right. Not lipo suction. Lipo. Yeah. What's lipo. it called? What's it called when you a lap band? Yeah, a lap band. You know, any one of those things. You didn't do that. No. I swear to God. All right. So fasting. what what could make somebody lose 150 pounds? What did you do? Honestly, intermittent. And the reason fasting. why you're saying this too because you're inspiring people. There's going to be people watching so. that are going to be like, what, what What did he do? What did yeah. he do? No, and that's why I like talking about that and sobriety and stuff and like everything's possible. You know what I mean? Tell us. You know, so basically, yeah, I started walking. You know, you start easy, right? So I started walking because running was not in my fucking cards because everything hurt. And I started doing yeah intermittent fasting. So I, I would only eat like, you know, two meals a day. But after 18 hours, I cut out, you know, as many carbs, starches, sugars, etc. like that I could. And um, went back to what I knew, you know, greens, protein based, healthy proteins, stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I don't drink sodas or juices or fucking energy drinks or any of that. I love Coca Cola, man. And you can have them. You just can't have them five a day. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I don't have five a day, but when I get ready to go on stage, that Coca Cola with the ice makes me go, watch out, I'm ready. Yeah, that's nice. And then I crash. Yeah, well, then there's that, you know. <laughs> and then I want a meatball sandwich at 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, we all do. But it's, it's shutting that voice up is, is tough. Like, shutting it down at, like, for me, I eat stupid early. I shut it all down around, like, 6. But I, yeah, but that's not every night of the week. Like, there are nights, you know, I'll be out, you know, 12 o'clock. I'm like, let's go get some pizza. Let's get some fucking tacos. I'm going to go do it up. So, like, I'm at a point now where I can, like, do that. But for the first, you know, three months, you got to set a new standard in your life. And you got to set it mentally. <clears throat> How long did it take to lose that much weight? Uh, like two years. Wow. Year and so a half. you had to stick to that diet for two years? I mean, I'm, it, it's, a di it's not a diet. It's a lifestyle. You know what I mean? Like, I worked in a restaurant during that time, too. And it was like, you know, I tried my best. I'd still eat tortilla chips. But, you know, I'd get a salad at lunch. And then I'd walk the mile and a half home. And I was hustling the entire time around the floor, you know, when I was there and, and just doing the deal. Did you go to a doctor and get your cholesterol levels checked? Yeah, I'm straight, All man. the time? Blood, yeah, blood pressure's good. Cholesterol, heart, everything is good. Yeah. And, and was decent. My pulse was out of control because of my central nervous system and, uh, and the weight and all of that, too. You know, just new to sobriety. But all of it, I mean, you know, I got a physical in December and like, they're like, dude, you see in two years. You know, it's amazing to me. You look like the type of guy that could, could use to put on some weight. You're perfectly trim and slim and ready to be an everyday good looking dude. Whereas I look like I should lose 20 pounds. But if you put on five pounds, nobody would even notice. Except They'd be like, what, have you been going to the gym? <laughs> well, living in LA, I got to remain fuckable. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> got to remain fuckable. I'm trying to be fuckable. <laughs> well, the worst thing is too, you know, like living in LA, like I look at the shredded dudes that's a hung and I'm like, fuck, if I could only get that Brad Pitt fight club thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, like, so it's, and it's like what you said on that other podcast episode, I think it was with Bart and Nick, you're like, oh, if only I do Leno. Oh, if I only do a thousand person venue. Oh, if I only do a 5,000 person venue. It's, there's, there's, the goalpost has always moved once you hit that milestone, right? I'm glad you watched that because that I remember thinking to myself that I'm the only one that feels that way. How come I don't have this? And then you get it. I'm like, that's all I got? Yeah. I should have had that. And then you get that. And you're like, that's it? Why? I want more. Can I? A thousand seats. This is ridiculous. I should be yeah. doing two thousand seats. Yeah. How come he did two thousand and I didn't? Yeah, it could be with it never views. Stops. Yeah, views on Instagram. It's like, oh, I did a hundred. Awesome. If only I get a hundred and fifty. You get a hundred and fifty. Well, why wasn't it a hundred and eighty? That's totally worth... So being destination based also like for if you want to get into mental health and shit, living in by a destination like, oh, if I make this much money, then I'll be happy. If I marry this girl or guy, like I'll be happy. Like if you start living in a destination base, which I used to live for over three decades of my life, you're going to be fucking unhappy. So if you can reset the clock every day like that, you are happy in, in this moment, then you're going to have enough and your cup will constantly be refilled. I'm trying. I am really trying. Did you guys hear what he just said? Living in the destination. How do you just say it? Because a, a lot of yeah. people do. I know I do. No, I do too. You know, next time month, time. if I can do this, rather than just thinking, you know what, this is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares about next month? We're right here, right now. This is cool. Yeah, you, just, you know, and that's like shit. Like the program teaches you, right? It's like you know, moment to moment, day by day. 
You just stay in the moment. As long as you can stay centered in the moment and in acceptance and living it for what is in front of you and not future trip, you know, like living in the future and being destination based. Oh, if I only move to LA, then I'll have the dreams of my future and I'll meet the girl I want. And I'll be happy. It's like, well, no, but you have, Hey, you got to do a lot of internal work to get the shit you want externally. And you just have to live moment to moment. Like think about the future, plan for shit, you know, put money away for five years, you know, do that run today so you don't have to you know be on diabetic medication in the future you know but there's other stuff you know like that you could do you know day by day it's good to hear it's good to listen to especially by someone who actually changed did you see the picture <laughs> it lost 140 pounds that is a goal and but it took a couple of years mm -hmm. so you did the right thing by it yeah great funny thing. i didn't give up man I have this thing, and I know a lot of my comedian friends have it too, like say, I came back into Hollywood, haven't been here in quite some time, I was out on tour, and I'm like, I hope I get spots at the Laugh Factory. I haven't played there in a while, that's my home club. A week goes by, I don't get any spots. I don't get, the phone's not ringing, I'm like, oh man, they got new people there, nobody remembers me. Then the phone rings and says, oh, we got three spots for you over the weekend. And I'm like, oh, great. Oh, I was wondering if I was going to hear from you. Yeah, we'll give you Friday, Saturday. Do you want a spot on Sunday? I'll go, yeah. And then they go like this. Um, so one spot's going to be at 1030. Another one's going to be at 11. And then you can close the show on Sunday at 12. And I go, why do I got to have the late sets? Can't I go early? Right. It's never enough. <laughs> it's fucked up, it's isn't it? never enough, dude. And the thing is, those are the key spots. Yeah, those are good spots. The closing spots. Yeah. When the strongest comes out at the end. Hell yeah. And I'm in my head going, no, I, I, can't I go earlier? <laughs> I know. I got to be more like you. Well, no, I'm not perfect, bro. Trust me. Like, it, it, I, 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 I'm, I'm always in stinking thinking too, dude. Like, you know, I get these gigs and instead of being grateful, I'm like, oh, these motherfuckers only want to pay me like two thirds of what I'm worth. You know, I live in LA and that kid's having that big opportunity with an artist that I know. Like, why does he get that opportunity when I have all these friends and all this tenure and da 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 da? And I just got to be like, dude, just shut the fuck up. Like, you live here, you're being paid as a comedian to do what you love in this town. I'm getting paid as a visual creator in the, the place that sets the standard. Like, I should be fucking grateful for that. You know, so I just, I, I try to quiet the voice in my head because he can be loud as shit sometimes. I like that. Yeah. The voice in my head could be loud as shit. Dude. Yeah, if you're like, well, shut up. <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> Me. <laughs> the, oh, yeah. The angel and the devil on the shoulder, they've killed each other multiple times, man. It's just, yeah. You it's know, one thing day. is that, you know, we get high when we perform. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, a euphoria, unlike anything. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk to some live performers, whether they're comedians or singers, and you say, um, what's it like? I'm like, well... Take the best drug you ever did, the highest high you've ever been, the greatest food you've ever eaten, the greatest sex you've ever had, roll it into one, boom, that's live performing. Yeah. So when you come down and the show's over, the following week you're like, oh, yeah. oh somebody, somebody going to get back up there. Yeah, chase that dragon. And that's why a lot of entertainers do go to alcohol or some kind of a, a substance totally. to get them out of that. Mm. Now, I don't. I just look for the, the stand-up drug. Yeah. Get, get me back on. Let's go. Yeah, that's good. That's hustle. And, uh, and I'm happy about that. And then there are times where I'll actually go to a club and not want to go on because the high is actually, they're going to ask me if I want to, and I say no. Yeah. I'm cool just being here, hanging out, watching everybody. It's not my show. So your ultimate high is going to be, of course, directing, producing, putting together shows. What have you worked on, and, and what can we actually take look a look at? Man, that's a really great question. Like, I'm, I'm kind of below the radar where no one's really kind of seen. It, it's not mainstream enough. Like, you're not going to find me on HBO. You're not going to, you know what I mean? It doesn't really matter in a way because that you think that that's what everybody's thinking. Sure. There's also projects that people haven't seen that could go find on the internet and could say, well, I saw that guy on live from my mother's basement, he's behind the camera in this, or he took the picture of those people. So it's actually always worth saying what you did do, because you never know where it's gonna pop up. And recently mm -hmm. I was in this movie called Hanging in Hito, nobody ever saw this movie. Mm -hmm. And re all of a sudden now people are Googling it. Mm -hmm. And I had a small role. That's a good point. And they're like, holy shit, you're in that? And I'm like, yeah, oh my God. And they're like, man, what a, 
what a bad movie. I'm like, I know, I know, but it was cool though, right? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> whatever. We have to do something. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like what would be of note because, you know, like photography wise, a lot of the stuff that I put out could be like, you know, portraiture or like live, you know, stuff for bands um, or, you know, things like that. Tell us about Guns N' Roses. I mean, no, that's a fun one. Yeah, sure. Um, I, years ago, you know, I've, I've been actually blessed to work with a lot of like really big musicians and celebrities like like on the low though you know what i mean or like bef either before they got super famous like somebody like skrillex or like miguel who became super famous you know i got to work with them like as they were coming up and then you meet somebody like slash who this is you know years later after the you know the, the guns and roses hurricane that took over the world in the you know late 80s and early to mid 90s so uh Long, long, long story short, I was down in Miami, and in March every year, there's what is known as Ultra Music Fest, which used to be called the Winter Music Conference. And this is the biggest week of electronic music DJs, producers, etc. They descend upon Miami, Florida. They take over all the clubs and the restaurants and the hotels, and the biggest names from around the world go there. So it, now it culminates with a festival called Ultra, which is in Bicentennial Park or Biscayne Bay, something like that every year and it's a two day music festival. So I'm down there with the team, we're shooting, we're partying. This is like 2014, I think it is 2014, 2015. And um, the guys I was with had a connect out here in Los Angeles that knew Slash's wife at the time. And they were interested in hooking up with us, the media team, to follow him around for a few days because he was debuting a track with a large a uh, Dutch house music producer named DJ Chucky. And they were the secret guest that was going to be on the main stage the day two. So they were they were like, let's document this moment. This is a legendary guitarist, you know, who's, you know, bridging the gap between two oceans and two genres to create this whole thing. So we, uh, we ended up at, at some, you know, mansion. It was like a Thursday morning or something like that. I remember... We, we all, you know, go in tandem to him and, and, you know, start filming, whatever. First of all, super nice guy, really nice guy, level, grounded, remembers your name, you know, kind of a guy. Um, so definitely nothing bad to say about old Slash. And one of my fun memories is, you know, we're like leaving wherever we were at the time. And we're, you know, in Miami, you have to go over the causeways and pay the tolls. And I remember we're in this like caravan of like, you know, SUVs and we're going over one of the causeways and the toll booth guy stops and he gives the money back to us. And he goes, oh, no kid. <laughs> he recognized him. He was like, wow. was he wearing his big black hat? Or? Uh, at that point, no, I'm, I'm looking at the video footage in my head. No, he wasn't wearing his hat at the time. I think that's for the stage. You know what I mean? But like he was like. As long as I, the oh, wow. 250 oh, came wow. back, you know what I mean? Yeah, wow. Okay. And then we went to the park and we did, you know, a walk. Who gets through. comped in a toll? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. You know what I mean? Uh, it was that was just like a fun little moment, but yeah, That's a great memory, man. We we went through. We did the walk through, you know, with the production, you know, the AV production team. Um, you know, okay, this is the riser. It's gonna go up. You're gonna go on it. There's gonna be you know 25,000 people. Da 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 da. You know, did that whole walk through and follow him around for a couple days and, and ended up on the boat because um, the, the green room is actually a cruise ship that's like parked right in the bay. So, you know, we ended up on there. And, yeah, it's, it's a whole vibe. Where's your green room? You see that yacht? Yeah, fourth floor. <laughs> yeah. You know, Paris Hilton. On the boat. Dude, Paris Hilton shows up all hammered. You know, it's like it's a whole. It, yeah, it, it's, it's a fun time. That's, that's the second time I was on that boat. But, uh, yeah, it was just a great weekend. And we culminated with this huge dinner at... Prime 112, right there on Ocean. I remember there's like 25 of us, man, and they're, they're bringing out Ai Tuna, you know, the size of my head. And um, and I'm sitting next to his wife, and this guy walks up, and he's like, oh, hey, like, I, I want to talk to Slash. And she's like, no, 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 no. Like, he's not taking any guests or, like, autographs. And I was like, that's that's Timberland, who's, like, one of the biggest, you know, hip-hop music producers of all time. Right, right. And it's like, let the, let, let the boys talk. So they go over and he sits at the end of the table and they're chatting, da 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 da. And, and uh, I remember the bill came and it was like twenty five grand. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> yeah, it was a great dinner and I remember I get out of the car. Twenty five thousand dollar dinner party. Yeah, I mean this is just a dinner. This is the normal dinner. And uh, yeah, we got out of the car and he shook my hand. He was like, "Thank you for everything, Sean. Like it was really cool and I love your Bill Murray shirt. <laughs> That's what I was wearing." Slash yeah. Guns and Roses. 
I guess he had some of the most famous guitar solos in the history of rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Is that the 80s? I mean, really, 90s? the early 90s is like when they became mainstream with yeah. Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. But yeah, I mean, and the tour with Metallica, that like three-year tour they did. Holy yeah. shit. I wonder how they're all doing now. I mean, they're still doing music. They, Guns N' Roses toured. They're doing another tour. Yeah. I believe this year. Greatest, greatest time of my life back in that time, boy. Yeah. All I think of is music. like, I mean, I was too young, but I mean, I just think of like Jack Daniels, heavy metal parking lot, and like, you know, Guns N' Roses. Yeah. That's what I think about. The, the good old days. I was like eight. <laughs> so you became friends with him? No, I mean, we were cool. You know, we spent like three days together. He was super nice. And, um, you know, unfortunately, and that was like just a project that never saw the light of day. You know, I have some of the raw footage that I shot. There's a bunch of other raw footage that I shot on another camera that lives on a hard drive. And it was supposed to be part of this package. And that package never came out. When you go to get work, so you probably have your hard drive of work to show people. Is that, that correct? So I have many hard drives. And I actually create what's known as a showreel. Probably, you probably do the same of like maybe stand up bits or yeah. um, as an actor, you know, whatever. Sizzle reel. Yeah. Okay. So literally this week, because of the rain, and this is what I do every year, I sit down usually in January or February when it gets a little slow, and I do my show reel for that year. So I'll take my best projects and the best clips from that project from the year before, and I make a string out, a sizzle of that, and that is my show reel for 2023, 2024. So I just put that out a couple of days ago on Instagram, and it's just some of the people I worked with some of the cool projects, some of my favorite shots. My boy Tom Marsh from New York composed an original piece for it. And I put it out there as, this is me active. So I have like that reel the year before, the year before that, I have a behind the scenes reel, I have a commercial reel, I have an events reel, I have a music video reel. I have like all this different stuff, advertising, just kind of show. I'd like to see I that. Am. I'd like to yeah, see bro. that type of stuff. So that's what I do. There are there is so many different things that uh, a director or photography can do, especially when you put together reels like that. A documentary, I guess, it is a different animal than shooting a uh, a movie. Oh, it's a completely because you, it, it's funny. So in documentaries, you know, you have to, even if the documentary was the movie, right? It's like a mockumentary. Yeah. Yeah. Like Christopher Guest, but yeah, no, like. So documentaries is kind of, you can nuance some stuff and kind of like, you know, set up an interview or set up like, you know, these two key people meeting to have this big moment on film. But a lot of it is really standing off and letting things happen. Whereas if you're directing a feature, you are integral to crafting every scene the way you need it, right? So they're two different things. And I find myself really adept at creating mini documentary, short form, verite narratives. That's kind of my bread and butter is creating three to five minute you know, person of interest or, you know, a, a situation of interest kind of story and telling that short form story, whether it be for the government or for brands or for advertising or for initiatives or artists. That's what I kind of think I'm really good at. So you shoot a lot of live performances? Not so much because they don't pay anything. Right. So and I know do it for the love. And, you know, I do that from time to time. But I wish I got to shoot more live performances or just be paid to shoot more live performances because that's that's what gets me high. Of course, I've been taped as a live performer. And sometimes as a live performer, you've been filmed so many times, you start to look at the camera team and go, why are you standing there with that camera? Could you get off the stage? <laughs> Could somebody tell this cameraman he doesn't belong there? And now you're making me nervous because he's there. Somebody said that this is okay. And I've done those type of shows. And they're like, well, you know, that guy's paying for it. I go, yeah, but aren't you going to fall off the stage? <laughs> yeah, it's got to be a little different with a comedian where I've shot comedians. I actually shot some pretty big guys last year at the uh, the Bourbon Room, which was cool. Oh, and, wow. Okay. I know the yeah, Bourbon Room. It's a great room. That's, that's a nice. Great, that's a great room. We do a lot of cool shows in there. And um, so after that, um, I, I actually work with a pretty big comedian musician right now, uh, Hannibal Burris. And he that's not on stage. That's off stage doing more kind of like stuff for him and content that he wants to create. But when you're in like, so shooting on stage, cause I'm lucky enough to have worked on some big stages, you know, 20,000 people, 25,000 people, you know, some photographers I've watched them like make themselves kind of like part of the show. It's like, you're not part of the fucking show. Like put your hands down, like 
shoot there, wear black, blend in, disappear, you know, behind the monitors, and don't don't fuck up that man's meal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because they're there to see them. They're not there to see you. So hide. <laughs> I was doing you this know? one shoot, and these two camera guys were on the edge of the stage, and they put up sticks. And I go like this. I go, why are you guys in this position? And he goes, so we can get side shots. I go, first of all, you're too close. You're going to get my ear. And isn't that the main camera up there? He goes, yeah. I go, you're in the shot. Yeah. I'm the comedian. I shouldn't be telling you guys this. Right. Well, that's a bad director. That's a bad. I hope he's not your boy. He was outside in a truck. Yeah. There no, you go. different, different guys. Okay. Somebody else was the headliner. I was just being part of it, and I was like, you know, oh, okay. You really shouldn't do this. And then this one other show that I did, which came out pretty good, his reverse camera was in the center, filming mm. the audience. Mm. So whenever the comedian passed in front of the camera, you can't see the audience. And I remember going like this. <laughs> Should have put his, your ball on his head. <laughs> hey, listen, man. I hope we get to do a project together. It seems like it would be yeah. a lot of fun. Where can uh, the audience find your work on on social media? Yeah, absolutely. Everything is pretty streamlined uh, as far as Facebook, Twitter, and um, Instagram. And, and my URL for my website, it's Shawnee Cameras. Everything. At Shawnee Cameras or S-E-A-N-N-I-E-C-A-M-E-R-A-S. Shawnee Cameras. Shawnee O'Grady. Yeah, buddy. How Irish is that? Is that where your family's from? It's about 85%, something yeah. like that. And uh, I'm actually, I'm blessed enough to go back. I, I have new clients in, in Ireland that are <clears throat> in the county where my mother's side is from. So I was actually back out there. I was out there in October working on a project. And um, my cousins that I hadn't seen in 26 years came out, took me to dinner. We hung around did the whole deal and now I get to go back in April and May to work on another project and they're out there and I get to connect with my roots and in my family it's it's a blessing there's a really cool place on the Jersey Shore I just got to say this I think it's called Kelly O'Grady's okay Kelly O'Grady's and you go in there and you get those big fat sandwiches with a huge pickle and coleslaw what am I thinking what am I thinking what is this sandwich come on it's the Irish thing. There's sauerkraut. That's not. There's no Irish sauerkraut, bro. No, no, no. Well, come on. Well, I guess that's <laughs> German. Corn beef and cabbage. Yes, there you, you go. Yeah, there yeah. you go. There right. You go. Yeah. People go there in the afternoon. You go home and go to sleep. Oh yeah. With big fat French fries. What's oh, that boy. French fry called? That's the fat one. Like steak, steak fry. Yeah. Steak fries. Yeah, yep. yeah. Kelly O'Grady's Route oh, 35 man. Neptune. <laughs> that sounds nice. That sounds nice. <laughs> you get a big fat beer. I really don't drink beer, but they got the the dark beers, you know. Yeah, Guinness, it's famous. You get all those, all those, whatever things, taps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really don't drink beer. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the police. I'm They're the fucking police. I don't, the, the thing you pull. <laughs> yeah. Just make sure it's there. The Otherwise, cranks. The beer want, cranks. <laughs> it's, it's just crank. Where's your favorite place to hang out in Los Angeles? Wow, my couch. <laughs> No, I, I go to the beach a lot. I run to the pier, uh, Santa Monica Pier, every morning. I love that. That's a really nice place. Um, <clears throat> I love going uh, I love going to venues. I'm going to the Fonda tonight. I love the Palladium. I love the Bowl. Hollywood Bowl is great. I've never been to the Hollywood Bowl. Oof. I've driven by it a million times that's on our cool. way into Hollywood. But I did play the Palladium. Oh, that's a big. A long, long time ago. That's a big room. Yeah. That's what's up. That was huge. Yeah, fuck yeah. Big special event. The Hollywood Palladium, but I think at that time they weren't even doing much to it. I think that was once where they had the Oscars. Probably. And I mean, you can fit like 10,000 people in there, yeah. 7,500 people. What they do when they have certain entertainers, they cut it up. They yeah. Put a partition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This way a thousand people doesn't look like it's empty. So one of my favorite clubs is the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. I don't know if you know it. It's been around for 35, 40 years, and they have... Um, I've been backstage tons of times and they have a sign that uh, says like, you know, push motherfucker. And you literally move the stage because it's like an 1800, 2000 person venue. And you can move the stage like 40 feet in where if it's not going to sell out, you can kind of give it that vibe and push the stage. Like it's like 40 feet or something in and yeah, and give it that, that intimate feel. It's really cool. How does anybody even hire someone like yourself for a project? And this is what I mean by this. People say to me, hey, how much do you go for to do a private party? Uh, how much do you go for to host an awards show? 
uh, what is your rate for mm. a regular comedy club? Yeah. And I say to him, well, it's all different. Yeah, it is. Sunday through Thursday, you can get me for this type of money, but a Friday, Saturday, I need this kind of money. Yeah. How many people are coming? How much are the tickets? Mm -hmm. There's so many questions yeah. to say, uh, this is where, how I'm going to come up with the price. There's no set price. I would assume that's got to be the same thing for you in a way. 100%. I mean, there there are like kind of like industry standard rates for people based on positions here in Los Angeles and in the industry, but no one really adheres to that because of how I started this conversation with everybody wanting to be in you know, Hollywood or, you know, in the entertainment game and with budgets dwindling and inflation and all, any fucking excuse you want to come up with, you know, you have to kind of guess and check, right? So I have to set a rate on a very similar principle that you do. Okay, if this is a corporate entity, then I'm going to charge more money because A, I know you have the budget and B, you can, I mean, you can, you can afford it. And then if I'm working with like a musician, not to disrespect them, but unless it's backed by like, you know, an independent investor, they're not going to be able to pony up as much money. So you do kind of like one for them, one for you. So I do a lot of corporate work because it does pay very well. And it also gets you into rooms that you may not necessarily, you know, be a part of. So I do have like kind of like a get out of bed number that's like, I won't get out of bed for this based on what you need and how much equipment I have and the, the amount that it is. But some people will be like, oh, well, I'm going to pay you $1,000 for a day, but you don't have to work very much. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, well, that doesn't fucking matter. I did a gig last year where the guy's like, I told him my rate and he countered at like two thirds the rate. He's like, but you don't have to do anything. And I was like, my guy, you do this too. Don't tell me that just because I'm sitting there for 14 hours, which I did and didn't do shit. Just because I'm sitting there for 14 hours, that's not the principle. The rate's the same no matter where you go and what you do. Whether you put me to work for those 14 hours is on you, bro. If I'm shooting for 14 hours, then I'm shooting for 14 hours. If I'm shooting for eight of them or nine, then it's up to you to fill the rest of that time and get me for all the money that you're paying me. Yep. So no matter what, when you walk out the door, that's how much I'm worth. Yeah. Plus travel. Yeah, no one wants to ever pay for travel, your gear rental, expenses. I, I had to hit up a company uh, before I got here because they sent me a 1099 that included my travel expenses. And I said, no, I need these deducted from the 1099 because I'm not being taxed an extra thousand dollars because all you have to do is separate it. Do you have mostly your own equipment? Yeah, hell yeah. And, but no one wants to pay for that. And I have $30,000 worth of camera gear. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And it's like, you know... How do you think that camera gear appears? Out of fucking thin air? It's like I had to buy it with money. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy that says I can't wait to start doing my project because sometimes the projects don't happen. But I really do hope that I get to go back into filming what we were doing, season two, and hire you to come on board because you would have a ball. I believe it. And we were all doing really great shit and the chemistry with everybody was spot on. And uh, we made pretty good money. We made pretty good money. One of the greatest things about when you hire comedians is at night, we're going to go out and make money anyway. Yeah. During the day, we could take a cut because we were going to be there. Mm. And that's how we were doing what we were doing in this little project that I did. So I try not to talk about it because, you know, half these things don't come to fruition. But sometimes shooting live shows are a lot of fun. Mm. It's a lot of fun because you don't even know what the fuck is going to happen. Yeah. Somebody heckles you and the camera start going, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that guy? <laughs> and if you're the audience, you don't need to heckle. Don't be part of the show. <laughs> Go scrub no, back the eight, eight minutes prior when I said don't be part of the there's show. There's always somebody. Yeah, dude, fuck off. because <laughs> you pay the admission doesn't mean you have to be an asshole. Yeah, right. Yeah, shut up, dude. All right, well, listen, man. One more time, I want you to tell everybody how they can find you, take a look at your work, or maybe give you a phone call and say, hey, I'm interested in making this project, yeah. whether it's going to be something from a corporate event, making a movie, shooting somebody like, you know, a big rock and roll star from Guns N' Roses, or I don't know if you do weddings and stuff like that, or a photo shoot. Photo shoots. Tell everybody. Yeah, I, I white label a couple weddings a year, but... <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I just, you kind of like ghost shoot it. You don't tell anybody. You just kind of go up, shoot it, get the check, and then just... Oh. Yeah, just kind of let it go. Kinda white He's label. a white shooter. Oh, no, no, no. 
no, that's a, that's a different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> no, you can find me on my URL, www.shawneecameras, S-E-A-N-N-I-E-C-A-M-E-R-A-S.com. Same with Instagram, same with Twitter, same with Facebook, all that jazz. Shawnee Cameras. Yeah, buddy. That's his nickname. But his real name is Sean O'Grady. That's right. All right. Well, listen, we got to get going, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank my producer, Tatiana Blue Show, for always making sure we have a great podcast and getting in touch with some really cool-ass guests and having them come down to the basement and hang out. Remember, everybody, let's make America Italian again. You know the motto. You don't know nothing. You don't see nothing. You don't say nothing. And how do I end every single one of my podcasts by saying the same thing with my guest? I don't take no shit from nobody. You ready? Yo, Don't take, take no, no shit, shit from, from nobody. nobody. <laughs> hey, folks, thanks for watching live from my mother's basement. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, hit the word like and leave me a really cool comment. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the future episodes and you can watch some of the funniest videos on the Internet. You can also listen to the show on Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Thank <laughs> you.